Statue 12 from number the guard. Mr. Rosen tripped on the loose step outside the kitchen door. His wife grasped his arm and he regained his balance. It's very dark, Mama whispered as they stood in the yard with their blankets and bundles of food gathered in their arms. And we can't use any kind of light. I'll go first. I know the way very well and you follow me. Try not to stumble over tree roots in the path. Feel carefully with your feet. The path is uneven. And be very, very quiet, she added unnecessarily. The night was quiet too. A slight breeze moved in the tops of the trees and from across the meadow came the sound of the sea's movements, which was a constant sound here and had always been. But no birds called or cried here now in the night. The cow kept, slept silently in the barn, the kitten upstairs in Kirsty's arms. There were stars here and there, dotting the sky among thin clouds, but no moon. Anne-Marie shivered, standing at the foot of the steps. Come, Mama murmured as she moved away from the house. One by one, the Rosens turned and hugged Anne-Marie silently. Ellen came to her last. The two girls held each other. I'll come back someday, Ellen whispered fiercely. I promise. I know you will, Anne-Marie whispered back, holding her friend tightly. Then they were gone, Mama and the Rosens. Anne-Marie was alone. She went into the house crying suddenly and closed the door against the night. The lid of the casket was closed again. Now the room was empty. There was no sign of the people who had sat there for those hours. Anne-Marie wiped her eyes with the back of her hand. She opened the dark curtains and the windows. She curled once more in the rocker, trying to relax. She traced the route in her mind. She knew the old path too. Not as well as her mother, who had followed it almost every day of her childhood with the dog scampering behind. But Anne-Marie had often walked down and back that way, and she remembered the turns, the twists, the twisted trees whose gnarled roots pushed the earth now and then into knotted clumps, and the thick bushes that often flowered in early summer. She walked with them in her mind, feeling the way through the darkness. It would take them, she thought, half an hour to reach the place where Uncle Henrik was waiting with his boat. Mama would leave them there, pausing a minute, no more, for a final hug, and then she would turn and come home. It would be faster for Mama alone, with no need to wait, as the Rosens, unfamiliar with the path, slowly felt their way along. Mama would hurry, sure-footed now, back to her children. The clock in the hall struck once. It was 2.30 in the morning. Her mother would be home in an hour, Anne-Marie decided. She rocked gently back and forth in the old chair. Mama would be home by 3.30. She thought of Papa back in Copenhagen alone. He would be awake, too. He would be wishing he would have come, but knowing, too, that he must come and go, as always, to the corner store for the newspaper, to his office when morning came. Now he would be afraid for them and watching the clock, waiting for word that the Rosens were safe, that Mom and the girls were here at the farm, starting a new day with the sun shining through the kitchen window and cream on their oatmeal. It was harder for the ones who were waiting, Emery knew. Less danger, perhaps, but more fear. She yawned and her head nodded. She fell asleep, and it was a, a sleep as thin as the night sounds, dotted with dreams that came and went like the stars. Light woke her, but it was not really morning, not yet. It was only the first hint of a slightening lightning sky, a pale gleam at the edge of the meadow, a sign that far away somewhere to the east where Sweden still slept, morning would be coming soon. Dawn would creep across the Swedish farmland and coast, then it would wash little Denmark with light and move across the North Sea to wake Norway. Anne-Marie blinked in confusion, sitting up, remembering after a moment where she was and why. But it was not right, the pale light at the horizon. It should be dark still. It should still be night. She stood stiffly, stretching her legs, and went to the hall to look at the old clock. It was past four o'clock. Where was Mama? Perhaps she had come home, not wanted to wake Emery, and gone to bed herself. Surely that was it. Mama must have been exhausted. She had been up all night, had made the dangerous journey to the boat, and returned through the dark woods, wanting only to sleep. Quickly, Emery went up the narrow staircase. The door to the bedroom where she had slept with Ellen was open. The two small beds were neatly made, covered with old quilts and empty. Beside it, Uncle Henrik's door was open too, and his bed too was unused and empty. Despite her worry, Emery smiled slightly when she saw some of Henrik's clothes crumpled in a chair and a pair of shoes caked with barnyard dirt lying on the floor. He needs a wife, she said to herself, imitating Mama. The door to the other bedroom, the one Christy, Kirsty and Mama were sharing, was closed. Quietly, not wanting to wake them, Henry pushed it open. The kitten's ears moved, standing up straight, its eyes opened wide, and it raised its head and yawned. It pried itself out of Christie's arms, stretched, and then jumped lightly to the floor and came to Anne-Marie. It rubbed itself against her leg and purred. Kirsty sighed and turned in her sleep, one arm, free now of the kitten's warmth and comfort, flung itself across the pillow. There was no one else in the wide bed. Anne-Marie moved quickly to the window, which overlooked the clearing that led to the pass entrance. The light outside 
was still very dim and she peered through the dimness trying to see, looking for the opening in the trees where the path began, looking for Mama hurrying home. After a second she saw a shape there, something unfamiliar, something that had not been there the day before, a dark shape, no more than a blurred heap at the beginning of the path. Anne-Marie squinted, forcing her eyes to understand, needing to understand, not wanting to understand. The shape moved and she knew. It was her mother lying on the earth. We're going to go on to chapter 13. Still moving quietly, and this is called run as fast as you can. Still moving quietly so as not to wake her sister, Anne-Marie sped down the stairs and through the kitchen door. Her foot caught the loose step and she faltered for a moment, righting herself, then dashed across the ground to the place where her mother lay. Mama, she called desperately. Mama. Shh said, raising her head, I'm all right. But Mama, Amory asked, kneeling beside her, what's wrong? What happened? Her mother pulled herself to a sitting position. She winced in pain. I'm all right, really, don't worry. And the Rosens are with Henrik. That's the important thing. She smiled a little, though her face was drawn with pain, and she bit her lip, the smile fading. We got there quickly, even though it was still so dark, and it was difficult for the Rosens, not knowing the path. <laughs> Henrik was there waiting on the boat, and he took them aboard and down below so quickly to the cabin that they were invisible in an instant. He said the others were already there. Peter got them there safely too. So I turned and hurried home and I was so anxious to get back to you girls. I should have been more careful. Talking softly, she brushed some grass and dirt from her hands. Can you believe it? I was nearly here, well maybe just halfway, when I tripped over a root and went sprawling. Mama sighed, so clumsy, she said as if she were scolding herself. I'm afraid my ankle is broken, Anne-Marie. Thank goodness it is nothing worse. An ankle mends and I'm home and the Rosens are with Henrik. You should have seen me, Emery, she said, shaking her head with a wry look. Your proper mama caught crawling inch by inch. I probably looked like a drunkard. She reached for Emery's arm. Here, let me lean on you. I think if you support me on this side, I can make my way up to the house. Goodness, what a clumsy fool I am. Here, let me put my arm over your shoulders. You're such a good, strong, brave girl. Now, very slowly, there. Mama's face was white with pain. Emery could see it even though the faint light of the approaching dawn, even through the faint light of the approaching dawn, she hobbled, leaning heavily on her daughter, pausing again and again toward the house. When we get inside, I'll have a cup of tea, and then we'll call the doctor. I'll tell him I fell on the stairs. You'll have to help me wash away the grass and twigs. Here, Amory, let me rest for a minute. They had reached the house, and Mama sank down to the steps and sat. She took several deep breaths. Amory sat beside her and held her hand. Mama, I was so worried when you didn't come back. Mama nodded. I knew you would be. I thought of you worrying as I dragged myself along. But here I am safe with you now. Everything is fine. What time is it? It must be 4.30 or close to it, Amory replied. They will sail soon. Mama turned her head and gazed across the meadow to the sea and the vast sky above it. There were no stars now, only the gray, pale sky with pinkness at its border. Soon they will be safe, too. Amory relaxed. She stroked her mother's hand and looked out at the discolored, swollen ankle. Mama, what is this? She looked, she asked, suddenly reaching into the grass at the foot of the steps. Mama looked, she gasped. Oh my God, she said. Anne-Marie picked it up. She recognized it now and knew what it was. It was the packet that Peter had given to Mr. Rosen. Mr. Rosen tripped on the step, remember? It must have fallen from his pocket. We'll have to save it and give it back to Peter. Anne-Marie handed to her mother. Do you know what it is? Her mother didn't answer. Her face was stricken. She looked at the path and down at her ankle. It's important, isn't it, Mama? It was for Uncle Henrik. I remember Peter said it was very important. I heard him tell Mr. Rosen. Her mother tried to stand but fell against the steps with a groan. My God, she murmured again. It may have all been for nothing. Henry took the packet from her mother's hand and stood. I will take it, she said. I know the way and it's almost light now. I can run like the wind. Mama spoke quickly, her voice tense. Henry, go into the house and get the small basket on the table. Quickly, quickly. Put an apple into it and some cheese. Put this packet underneath. Do you understand? Hurry. Henry did instantly as she was told, the basket, the packet at the bottom. She covered it with a napkin, then some wrapped cheese and apple. She glanced around the kitchen, saw some bread, and added that. The little basket was full. She took it to where her mother was. You must run to the boat if anyone should stop you. Who would stop me? Henry, you understand how dangerous this is. If any soldiers see you, if they stop you, you must be pretend to be nothing more than a little girl. A silly, empty-headed little girl taking lunch to a fisherman, a foolish uncle who forgot his bread and cheese. Mama, what is it at the bottom? But her mother still didn't answer the question. Go, she said firmly. Go right now and run as fast as you can. Anne-Marie kissed her mother quickly, grabbed the basket from her mother's lap, turned, and ran toward the path. And that's the end of chapter 13.